A good example of pathogen host coevolution is the story of syphilis. Syphilis was a new disease in Europe in about 1495 it was first noticed. And take note of that year, it's suspicious for the origin. It appeared to be sexually transmitted and it was at first, it was a very severe disfiguring disease. People would lose their hair. They would have large sores over large portions of their body. And over the course of about 50 years, it went from being this visibly uh, uh, um, uh, noticeable condition where everybody could see that this person had it to being something really mild to where people would only get sores in their genital region. Uh, they would have much milder symptoms. It was still fatal, but it took much longer for it to be fatal. So in a very short amount of time, it evolved into a much milder disease, as you can imagine why, just because of natural selection. So if it's a severe disfiguring disease that is visually obvious to anybody that they have it, and it's also sexually transmitted, well, if it, it, the milder forms of the bacteria are going to have a greater chance of being passed on because you can't see that a person has it. So uh, 1495 as a year of origin for, and it first appeared in port cities, that seems very suspicious because 1492 was the year that uh, Columbus first landed in the Americas. And then from then on, there was a lot of ship traffic back and forth between North and South America and Europe. Uh, and now we can see from DNA analysis that the bacteria that causes syphilis is most closely related to the Yaws bacteria, which is an endemic condition in uh, South America. It causes a very mild skin condition. It is not sexually transmitted. Uh, most people are exposed to it as a kid. They have very mild symptoms and then they're immune and it goes away. So it's a very, very different disease, but the bacteria is closely related. So the hypothesis right now is that when this bacteria was brought home by travelers from Europe, um, or you could think of them as invaders, from Europe, uh, and they went home, it was such a severe condition because this bacteria did not exist in that population. They had no immunity. They hadn't been exposed to any related bacteria or anything like it. So there was zero immunity. So even though the bacteria was the same, it initially caused an extremely severe illness in the Europeans who contracted it because even though it's a very mild um, short-term skin condition in those from South America. So, it, and it's continued to evolve because now since the 1940s and 50s, antibiotics have become a major weapon against syphilis. So people who know they have it, people who have symptoms, who have a visible sore, who have a, a fever, uh, seek medical treatment, get antibiotics and kill the bacteria. So the bacteria, the syphilis bacteria that survive are ones that cause the mildest symptom-free illness. So there's been a great increase in people who uh, are carriers of syphilis who can transmit it to others, but who have uh, little or no symptoms. Uh, because if you don't have symptoms, you don't seek treatment. So there's been natural selection for with the syphilis bacteria to be more mild. The same thing, interestingly, has happened with strep bacteria. Strep throat used to be an extremely severe condition that would lead to a possible heart infection, kidney infection, skin infections, uh, deadly infections with strep. And since antibiotics are being used to fight it, it has become milder and milder until now we have uh, a strep throat is fairly mild in most people. And in fact, asymptomatic spreaders of strep have been uh, found that people who have the strep bacteria in their throat, they can spread it to others. They, are, they don't even have any symptoms whatsoever. 
So uh, this is something that could happen and does happen with viral diseases as well, evolving to be milder. And that's one of the things that people are concerned about with Ebola and Marburg. So Ebola and Marburg viruses uh, cause a very severe kind of illness called a hemorrhagic fever. And you can see uh, the root in there for blood, hemo. So a hemorrhagic fever, well, you have a fever, but you also have bleeding. You bleed from all of your mucous membranes. So bloody diarrhea, bloody nose, bleeding from the mouth, uh, bleeding into the uh, intestinal tract. It's an extremely uh, serious illness. Um, now, before 2014, what would happen is Ebola, or, Ebola and Marburg are very similar. Ebola is a little bit more common. A little outbreak would occur in some isolated village somewhere in Africa, and uh, dozens or a hundred people would die. And by the time healthcare experts got there and people from the World Health Organization got there, it would have already disappeared. And they and, and and there wouldn't be any more active cases, and then it would disappear for years, and then there would be no human cases for years, and then it would pop back up again in another isolated area. So the fact that it disappears for years, remember, viruses cannot survive outside of a body for long. They have to be constantly being passed from body to body to survive. So that means there's an animal that's the main endemic organism that's hosting this virus and it's only occasionally ending up in a human. It has another species that it's normally found in that's maintaining it in between the human outbreaks. Um, what that species is we don't know because as of the last time I checked which was just a couple of months ago no wild animal or domestic animal had ever been found to contain Ebola or Marburg. So it's suspected to be fruit bats because every village where they've had an Ebola or a Marburg uh, outbreak is a village where people consume fruit bats for bushmeat. And bats are, have a lot of viruses because they're social animals. They very easily pass viruses to one another. So bats are suspected, especially fruit bats. So people who live in these areas where these viruses pop up occasionally have been told to not eat fruit bats for bushmeat um, but of course, people who are very who have very limited protein um, may do that anyway. Um, the big outbreak that started in 2014 uh, that lasted like a year and a half, something like that. Uh, tens of thousands of people were killed in. Uh, there was actually more than three countries. These were the three biggest countries: uh, Liberia, Sierra Leone, and Guinea. Uh, and it was actually traced back to the village of origin. They very quickly, within a couple of weeks of this outbreak, traced it back to the village of origin, even to case one. They found there was a boy who was eight or ten years old who was case one in this particular epidemic. Unfortunately, though, by the time scientists got to that village where the first case occurred, uh, people in there already knew that fruit bats were suspected of spreading this. You know, they had been warned not to eat fruit bats. And there was a fruit bat colony in the middle of the village, in a hollow tree in the middle of the village. And the people had already burned the tree before scientists got there. So they weren't able to take samples or anything, um, which is unfortunate because that's probably where it came from, was the, from this, uh, the fruit bats that were in that tree. But we don't know for sure. We don't know for sure. Hundreds of different animals have been tested, and we still don't know what animal species is hosting this virus. Um, now, most of these outbreaks, the death rate uh, was about 90%. Um, but we now know that with good hospital care and IV fluid support, that the death rate could actually be much lower. And of the three people who ended up in the United States with Ebola, Two of them were healthcare workers. One of them was um, somebody who was from, I think it was Sierra Leone, who was home visiting family and came home to Texas and then ended up with symptoms a few days later. All three of those people survived. <clears throat> so it's quite possible that the death rate from Ebola is actually lower. Um, in the clinics that they set up 
in Africa, the death rate was about 50%, which is significantly lower than with no medical care. So that shows medical care can make a big difference with this. Uh, and there is a vaccine that's uh, in development for Ebola. Um, but one of the concerns is that it might evolve into a milder disease. And especially with this first big epidemic as it was being passed through the human population, pass, pass, pass to different people, mutations are occurring. And the viruses that are being selected for are ones that have milder symptoms. Because the milder person's symptoms are, the less they're going to likely to realize that they are sick and the less likely they are to realize that they are infectious. And so they're going to pass those milder viruses to more new people. So that's something that's being looked at. There was another little uh, epidemic of Ebola more recently, um, but it, it was stopped much more quickly. So lower virulence could evolve. That would be of significant concern because that would mean that it could be spread to many more people. Um, it's easily transmitted by contact, but it's not very easily transmitted through the air. So, uh, but any bodily fluid will do. So even sweat from a person who's infected uh, can transmit it. Sweat that hits your skin, it can go through your skin. So it, it's, but you, it, it's not going to be transmitted over long distances like through the air. That doesn't seem to be a mode of transmission of Ebola, which is, that's a very good thing. Um, it does have a long incubation period, about 10 to 14 days, so that's plenty of time for people to travel. And that's probably the reason for this first epidemic, this first big epidemic of Ebola, is the increased roads. Um, all of these little remote villages where it's been popping up, until recently, they were pretty isolated, places you couldn't get to easily. And now there's more roads, it's much easier for people to travel to and from these villages. Um, on these new uh, newer roads that are there. So increased travel means increased exposure. There is no place on the planet now that you can't get to in three days uh, with a combination of air travel and, and motorized ground travel or motorized boat travel. You can get anywhere in three days. So that's less than the incubation period for most viral diseases. Um, so we are concerned about pandemics and is the fact that as I'm doing, as I'm making this, we are in the middle of a pandemic right now. Uh, the uh, COVID-19 pandemic is going on right now. Um, and uh, that means that it's global. And we really are a huge global community now, uh, all interacting with commerce and travel and tourism and any virus that's a threat in one part of the world a pandemic could result very easily. Um, so a zoonotic disease is one that jumps the species barrier from an animal. Uh, influenza is one that continues to do that because it's, it's a disease that also affects birds, uh, not just domestic birds, but wild birds as well. And that's uh, well, and domestic pigs are also involved with that, too. The 1918 pandemic is thought to have passed from pigs after uh, birds. So birds, pigs, then humans. Um, Ebola and Marburg are probably from fruit bats, although it's been extremely frustrating to scientists that they still have not identified for sure the wild source of this virus. Although it's not endemic, the uh, Ebola and Marburg are not endemic in the human population because years go by with no one being infected. So that means it cannot, it is not in the human population uh, as an endemic virus. The hantavirus, which it, it periodically breaks out here and there, luckily hantavirus is not transmissible human to human. Uh, people get it from mice, uh, from powdered mouse feces, usually in cabins or places where there have been a lot of mice, and you inhale the little tiny dust-like particles of mouse feces with this virus on it, and you can get a deadly respiratory illness from it. Um, the first SARS epidemic that happened in China, uh, it was traced back to a bat, uh, to the Chinese horseshoe bat. There was a large cave that was popular with tourists where these bats were that it came from, and that cave is now off limits to tourists. 
Um, West Nile virus is primarily a bird virus. This one hasn't been a huge deal in humans. People were concerned about it. It's spread by mosquitoes, uh, not directly from human to human. And it has affected mostly people who are already uh, medically vulnerable, like people like the elderly. Uh, it doesn't seem to have much or any effect on healthy or younger people. Um, smallpox, smallpox was originally a zoonotic uh, virus that jumped the species barrier from cattle. It first appeared in the human population after the domestication of cattle about uh, 9,000 years ago. So, um, and it's been eradicated. This is the first virus to be completely eradicated. And again, this is only possible with endemic human viruses like smallpox. It's the last case of smallpox was in 1979. And thanks to herd immunity from a huge vaccination campaign that went on worldwide. Polio is next. Polio is down to three countries now um, where they are, um, where a large vaccination campaign. Uh, we could have, polio could have been eliminated in the 1990s, but because of the uh, anti-vaccine nonsense that came out starting in the 1990s that made people suspicious of getting vaccinated and uh, polio went from being almost completely extinct to it having a resurgence for the last 20 years but uh, that's one of the world health organization projects is to get rid of polio and we're close um, probably within the next three years polio is going to be eliminated like smallpox um, so our new pandemic, which all of you are aware of, the disease is called COVID-19. 19 is for 2019, the year the disease was first noticed. Uh, the virus that causes it is SARS-CoV-2, and that's because it's most like the virus that caused the SARS-1 uh, epidemic in 2003. Um, the genome of this virus, which has been studied by people in China and European scientists as well and American scientists. It, they all agree that the genome looks completely like a wild virus. It doesn't appear to be an engineered virus. Uh, and if you were going to engineer a virus as some kind of germ warfare agent, you would not use a virus that uh, was previously not thought to cause serious human illness. <laughs> so uh, th uh, there are other coronaviruses that are circulating in the human population and they all cause really mild or cold-like symptoms or nothing at all. Um, this particular virus is different because it binds to the ACE2 receptors. Um, ACE2 receptors vary. This could be one of the explanations why young people seem to be unaffected. Uh, young people, especially very young children under five, just have fewer ACE2 receptors than adults. And gradually the number of ACE2 receptors increases. Uh, people with high blood pressure who are on medicine that is called ACE2 inhibitor, they have more ACE2 receptors, which could be why they appear to be particularly vulnerable to this virus. Um, ACE2 receptors are found all over the body, not just in the lungs, they're also found in all the mucosal epithelia, including uh, nasal cavity, sinuses, intestines, uh, liver ducts, pancreatic ducts. Uh, ACE2 receptors are also found in the blood vessels, which is why there's uh, been reports of weird clotting effects from this virus. Uh, there are also receptors in the brain and liver and kidneys, which explains why these organs also seem to be affected in people who are very severely affected by this virus. Um, new information continues to come in all the time, uh, especially about the origin of this virus. It, it, it appears to be very clear that the outbreak started in December, maybe in November 2019. Uh, it's a new virus that hasn't circulated in the human population before. So even though it's a wild virus, uh, it may not have been, uh, it may have been from that lab in Wuhan. There's a virology institute in Wuhan, and it's possible that this virus was uh, escaped to the human population as a result of sloppy lab techniques. This lab had previously been cited for being sloppy and handling viruses. 
So it's quite possible that someone who worked there got infected with this wild virus that they were studying and then went home and infected other people. Um, it doesn't look, it doesn't at all have any of the hallmarks that you would expect to find in a synthesized or engineered virus. So that appears not to be the case. So it, it definitely originated in Wuhan. Uh, whether it came from sloppy lab technique or whether it was uh, the result of the wet market there, which has both pangolins and bats, which this virus is most like, uh, well, the part that binds to the ACE2 receptor, the spike protein, is most like the pangolin virus. Other parts of the virus are more like this bat virus. So, uh, most people think probably the pangolin was the origin um, of this virus. Um, another kind of infectious agent that is has no genome is a prion. Prions are uh, a protein that is very hard to get rid of. We have no vaccine and no treatment for prion diseases. Prion disease only affects mammals, and all mammals appear to be vulnerable. Uh, mice humans, cows, sheep, deer. Uh, so we have a normal protein in our brain. The prion protein is, is in all mammal brains, and it's a normal brain protein. We don't know what its function is, uh, because in a mouse model where they knock out the prion protein, the mice brain still seem to function okay. So we don't know what the prion protein does in the brain, but all mammal brains have prion protein. And what the prion, the disease-causing prion is, is just a misfolded protein. Remember that proteins fold up in a particular way. Their three-dimensional structure is important for their function. Uh, the disease-causing prion is, this, is misfolded. And it's contagious misfolding because it bumps into a normally folded prion protein. It causes it to misfold too. So it gradually fills up that individual's brain with misfolded prion protein, which sticks together into these big aggregates and then kills brain cells. Um, the very first prion disease that was ever described has had been described in literature for hundreds of years, and that's scrapie in sheep. So here's a sheep that has scrapie, and they called it that because they rub themselves on the side of the barn or on trees until they actually rub their fur off. And so that's why it's called scrapie, because they scrape themselves. In cows, it's called mad cow disease. And they use the word mad in the sense that the Brits use it to mean crazy. So cows with mad cow disease, they lose the ability to walk. And uh, they moo a lot. So that's where the crazy comes in. Um, the name of the disease that they cause is transmissible spongiform encephalopathy. So transmissible, because it's contagious. Spongiform, because it turns your brain into a sponge. Uh, encephalo means in the brain. And there we see the root again, pathos, uh, pathy. So it's a, it's a contagious brain disease that turns your brain into a sponge. And here's a slice from somebody's brain who has it. And you can see the big holes. Uh, there's not supposed to be holes in a brain slice. Um, so mad cow disease, scrapie. In humans, it's called Creutzfeldt-Jakob disease. In deer, it's called chronic wasting disease. And it's caused by eating prions, so eating infected tissue. And sheep are thought to get it by, because, you know, sheep are not carnivorous, but they do eat each other's poop. And it's thought that that's how sheep get it is by eating other sheep's poop that has prions in it. Uh, there was a, an outbreak in Britain in the 1990s. About 100 people got Creutzfeldt-Jakob disease from eating uh, beef that was fully cooked. You can't get rid of it by cooking. It doesn't matter if it's well done. Um, and the way the cows got it was because the cows were being fed ground up sheep, rendered sheep carcasses. Rendered means it's like all cooked down uh, as a source of protein in their feed. And that's how the cows got it. And so they've stopped this because now it's uh, against the law to feed one mammal to another mammal, unless it's a carnivorous mammal. Uh, so there's not any more worries about mad cow disease. Uh, even deer have it in the U.S., so if you're a deer hunter, 
you're supposed to watch out for deer that look like they are not healthy and also stay away from the nervous tissue. So prions are only found in brain and the spinal cord. So they tell people when you are processing your deer, don't break open the brain or the spinal cord and just take the meat so that you won't get any prions. Um, and it appears to be contagious between mammal species, but not directly from individual to individual unless you eat them. So it's contagious by eating. Uh, so here's what happens. So we have our misfolded prion protein and a normal prion protein. Uh, the misfolded ones bump into the normal ones and cause them to misfold. And eventually you get these huge aggregates of stuck together prion protein, which kills the brain cells. Um, there is a genetic form of this. So a mutation can occur in the prion gene and that will cause the prion protein to be a misfolded abnormal protein. And there's a small uh, percentage of those in the general population, a sporadic, small number of sporadic cases of Creutzfeldt-Jakob disease just from new mutations. Uh, but it's very, very rare. Um, so we talked about in this chapter, viruses have two types of genome, RNA or DNA, and within that they can have a double strand or single stranded DNA, double stranded or single stranded RNA. Um, some viruses have an additional encapsulation with lipid on top of their protein capsid. Uh, usually it's phospholipid bilayer that they stole from the cells that they infect. They can only replicate within a host cell and it has to be a specific type. So viruses can only affect a certain number of species or even only one species. And then even within that species, only certain cells. So the cells have to have the right protein on the surface for the virus to stick to or it can't infect those cells. Uh, we talked about phages, which infect bacteria. And there are two cycles, the lytic cycle, which kills the cell and makes thousands of new virus particles and the lysogenic cycle where they insert themselves into the genome and just get replicated by bacterial uh, replication. Um, we talked about uh, prions and viruses and some of the diseases that they cause and these are often zoonotic. Prions are just protein. They're the only infectious agent that's known that doesn't have a genome at all. Uh, so that also means that they can't evolve because they don't have a genome. Uh, and for defense against viruses, vaccines so far are the best defense. We have very few effective antiviral drugs. Um, vaccines are the most successful um, remedy we have for viruses as a preventative. Um, okay, that's it for viruses.